Super excited to be here. So thank you, Adrian, for the invitation. Um, having a blast at the conference so far. Um, looking forward to the, uh, the rest of the discussions today. Uh, so yeah, like Adrian said, uh, um, today I want to talk about the initiative for open citation, and I want to give you a sense of uh, why we did this, how it came together, and what the, the rationale is for um, investing into um, efforts to uh, unlock references and citation data. Um, I want to start by giving you like a few reasons why I believe uh, open citations matter. Um, and I think that a good starting point is to look at Wikipedia itself. So uh, just to set things straight, you're really not supposed to cite Wikipedia, uh, no matter what your friends do, what your teacher says, you're really, really not supposed to cite Wikipedia. Um, and the reason for this is actually fairly simple. Wikipedia is not about the truth, it's about verifiability. So Wikipedia only works as long as it acts as a gateway to external sources, as it, as it works as a, as a uh, starting point for discovering um, external information. It's not a destination in itself. And open knowledge, you might say, fulfills its function as long as it, it is backed by carefully vetted, reliable secondary sources that everyone can look up and check for themselves. So this is what makes citations and references so critical for Wikipedia. Um, and you might think that if this is true for, for Wikipedia, uh, this should be even more true for scholarly knowledge at large. Uh, after all, science is a uh, like a S scale, the largest example of collaborative created uh, uh, knowledge production, right? So in principle, this should work uh, for science and scholarships as well. So let me give you three reasons uh, uh, as to why this also applies to scholarship. First off, the citation graph underpins our collective understanding of uh, where scholarship comes from. It allows us to understand uh, knowledge provenance, it allows us to understand how we know what we know in science and to understand the evolution of scientific debates. And scholarly citations are really the, the foundation uh, of, of knowledge in, in science and scholarship. And they represent the main transmission mechanism uh, that allows us to reconstruct the genesis of knowledge. Second, as I'm sure you'll know, pretty much the entire assessment system for science depends on the ability of counting citations. So pick your favorite metric, whether you like it or not, uh, no matter how good or, or bad it is at, at measuring the impact of a paper or a journal of a venue. Um, this metric will almost always depend on some way of counting citations. So again, the way in which collectively we assess um, scholarship is by using some notion of citation-based metrics. And finally, because of that, the prioritization of how we invest into research that's largely paid for by uh, the taxpayer ultimately depends on citations. So the availability of these citations, how we measure science using citations, affects what science we fund, how we allocate uh, taxpayer money to um, pursuing research. So, Given how critical citations are for this reason, for the uh, functioning and the, uh, the vetting of science, uh, you'd expect the citation graph is a, um, a shared resource that belongs to everyone uh, and that everyone can use. And the reality is not quite so. As it turns out, as of today, the primary source of data about scholarly citations that the entire planet depends on comes from uh, proprietary databases from uh, two companies. One is uh, Scopus, a product by Elsevier, and the other one is Web of Science uh, by formerly Thomson Reuters, uh, now Clarivate. So what does that mean in practice to have citations locked into uh, these two databases? Well, let's think again about these, these three factors that I mentioned before. So first off, uh, to understand the provenance of information, you need to get access to the systems. These systems only allow you to access data if your institution pays a subscription to um, um, Scopus or, or Web of Science. So as a regular citizen, you don't have the ability of access them unless, uh, unless your, your school pays for them. Um, second, the 
assessment and the impact evaluation that I mentioned before um, cannot be reproduced and vetted by the public. Right? So only people, again, with access to the systems can, uh, can be in charge of the, of the, of the vetting of, uh, of impact. And finally, and most importantly, uh, public funding of research uh, relying on this data depends on whatever uh, data curation policies these two companies have put in place. So for this reason, uh, I think it's very really important that we, we, we think about, uh, um, on the one hand, the, the, uh, the value, there is an immense value that these companies have, have provided by creating these curated data sets. But also we need to think about the fact that the underlying data doesn't belong to these two companies. The underlying data is non-copyrightable and as such should belong to the public. David Shutton has been one of the long-standing advocates for open citation and he called out this fact by saying it's a scandal that as of today we still have access to a, a good large-scale source uh, of uh, citation data and that this data is locked into um, repositories that are uh, by and large proprietary. So the question becomes, how do we even get started? How do we uh, think about creating at least the beginning of a corpus of citation data uh, and make it available to anyone without uh, any copyright restriction? So this is a low hanging fruit. Uh, and uh, sometimes ideas are uh, you know, beautiful and ripe and, and ready to be harvested um, and, and, and consumed. And uh, in this case, surely if you know, this data took so much effort to be curated, uh, you would imagine that uh, it's ready, ready available somewhere, right? It must have cost some effort for these companies to produce it. Um, so this is artificial ripening gas. And sometimes ideas need a little bit of help uh, to get to a point where they can come to fruition. And this is, in a nutshell, the story of the, uh, of the I4C. So it's a story of using ripening gas for, for public goods. Um, and uh, it's a story of how I believe a big uh, success story for openness um, started with little help uh, of a, a group of stubborn individuals uh, and uh, like-minded organizations. So let me tell you about uh, the initiative for open citations. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the website of the initiative uh, whose stated goal is to promote the unrestricted availability of scholarly citation data. What we mean by open citation data uh, is threefold. It's data that is one, machine readable. It's important that we make this data available not just for humans, but also for machines. Two, data that is separable, meaning that is uh, uh, separate from uh, the underlying bibliographic source that it represents and it belongs to. And third, uh, it's data that is freely accessible reusable and subject to no copyright restriction whatsoever. This is important, might come back later in discussing the licensing aspects of, uh, of this data. So how does this thing uh, come together? Well, it all started uh, with a realization back in September 2016 at um, COASP, the, um, um, the annual conference of the um, Open Access Publishing Association, that uh, this data actually existed it was not exposed by default. As it turns out, uh, um, most publishers deposit to Crossref, uh, not just the bibliographic record of uh, publications that have a, a DOI, a digital object identifier. In most cases, they also deposit the full um, reference record. It just turns out that this data is closed by default. So we suddenly realized that this data already exists. It doesn't require extra effort to be produced and generated. It's already released by publishers to Crossref, only in a closed form. So the challenge became, how do we persuade a, a, a group of influential publishers to flip and to make this data publicly available? Um, we started making a case and talking to people using this guerrilla team of uh, instigators of openness. Um, and we started telling the story that, one, this is not something that's gonna cost anything. The data is already there. Um, it, while it literally requires 
uh, a single email written to, uh, to Crossref to ask and release this data publicly. Uh, second, uh, insisting that this is not a goal that can be achieved alone by one or two publishers. For this to be effective, it needs to reach critical mass uh, so that we can make a, a statement and hopefully other publishers will follow. So it, it was really critical to get um, a large group of influential publishers, influential players uh, um, in, in the room uh, agreeing on, a, on this goal. And the way we started was to focus on uh, uh, publishers that held the largest amount of data. So we know um, there's public data about uh, the volume of publications that each publisher deposits to, um, to Crossref. And so we started targeting the top 20 publishers by um, volume of DOIs deposited to Crossref. We agreed on a deadline. Uh, we asked everybody to uh, prepare their communications plan and to hold off any announcement uh, just to make a big splash. Um, and we started doing this by uh, with the idea that uh, once we had uh, the, the main players on board, we'd be able to get traction and uh, bring on also the, the long tail of publishers uh, that may want to follow the example of the largest ones. So this is the progress so far of the initiative. Uh, prior to the launch of the I4OC, the percentage of uh, uh, DOIs deposited to Crossref with open references was 1%. 1% out of uh, about 38 million documents that Crossref knows about. Again, this is a tiny fraction of scholarship. <laughs> um, I'll come back to this later. Uh, this is not the universe of citations, but it's still a pretty sizable uh, corpus of the literature. So 1% out of 38 million articles uh, with references to the Crossref. At the time of the launch, six months after we started, uh, the fraction of publications went to uh, well, actually, right now, this is the most current uh, statistic. Um, the fraction of documents with open references in the cross database went from 1% to more than 40%. Um, what does that mean in practice? We currently have uh, 18 million articles uh, with open reference data. And that amounts to about half a billion um, individual citation links that are now freely available to everyone uh, as machine-readable data with no copyright restriction whatsoever. In the process of doing this, we also realized it's really important to um, get the word out and amplify the message. And so what we realized was really important for this was not just to talk to publishers, but to also build a, a coalition of allies, um, including major funders, scholarly platforms, open data organizations, and publishers as well, um, supporting the notion of unrestricted availability of scholarly citation data. So this is, as of today, uh, the list of, uh, of organizations that have uh, agreed to lend their name and their authority to support in this initiative. And the availability of data per se is, uh, is great, but as George was saying yesterday, it is really important that we just don't make data available. This data needs to get into action and produce impact, right? Um, and so this is how the data is currently being reused. Uh, one of the organizations behind uh, the initiative is Open Citations, um, co-founded by David Schotten and Silvia Peroni. And Open Citations has been producing a corpus that basically collects, cleans up, and republishes uh, citation data from Crossref and many other sources as basically um, RDF dumps. Um, you can access this data via Sparkle endpoints. Uh, you can access it statically as a set of dumps. Um, and it's a, a growing corpus of, again, fully um, open, uh, linked open data you can reuse for whatever purposes you want. Second, the um, community of scientometricians for a very long time could only use a proprietary data license from um, uh, the two databases I mentioned before. Um, as of the launch of the initiative, they started adapting their tools uh, so that they can now analyze and visualize these data, pointing, um, pointing them to the uh, Crossref API. So this is an example of a tool um, called VOS Viewer that allows you to uh, perform a, uh, graph analysis uh, and visualization on the citation network based on data 
uh, that now is coming from Crossref. And uh, the example that I'm mostly excited about is the reuse of this data in the context of Wikimedia, Wikimedia projects. Um, Wikidata, we talked about it yesterday, is an uh, open knowledge base. At the moment, uh, uh, one out of four items in Wikidata represents a source. So there's a massive coverage of creative works and bibliographic sources in Wikidata. And as part of creating a record of sources in Wikidata and cross-linking all the sources with all the other entities that exist uh, in Wikidata, uh, the community also started ingesting the citation graph. So as of today, we have a 36 million um, citation links that represent the connection between one paper and another paper, um, each of these represented as individual items uh, in the knowledge base. And um, what I think is really cool is that uh, um, people are now leveraging this data to create custom applications that are built on top of it. Um, Scolia is such an example, and I think I might try and give you a live demo. Uh, if I manage not to break everything here. All right. Let's see. Okay. Well, we do it like this. Um, so, Scolia is basically a very simple front end to uh, all data of scholarly relevance broadly defined that exists uh, currently in Wikidata. So you think of it as a way of exploring information about uh, authors, about works, about outlets, about in organizations, about scholarly awards, and whatnot. Basically, the entire corpus of knowledge existing in Wikidata as structured data. And uh, this is an example. So um, let's see the entry of an author. For example, let's take uh, Uta Frith, um, neuroscientist based in London. And this is all data that is currently in Wikidata and is generated uh, on the fly by querying uh, the Wikidata Sparkle endpoint. So all data you see here is just the result of uh, several Sparkle queries uh, stitched together. Um, and you'll see that there's a list of publications. Publications per year and statistics about uh, Uta Fritz <coughs> publication record. Venue statistics, these are the places where she mostly published her work. Her co-author graph. Topics. And of course, we can also link all this information to free licensed media uh, that exist in Wikimedia Commons uh, that can illustrate uh, um, this work. Timeline of education, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to take one example of uh, one of her papers. And see the information that we have. Um, uh, live demos. Yay. All right. Uh, let me find. Uh, All right, so this is an example of a, a record for individual publication. And you'll see it's a very um, sparse data source. We haven't ingested the entire citation network, but you can see here is basically the fact that uh, for this work, uh, uh, we can reconstruct the citation graph. And of course, we have uh, some query errors, but you get, a, you get a sense of this, right? So all of this is basically generated entirely from CC0 license data that has been ingested into Wikidata. And if you, uh, if you go here, you can basically see how this works. All right, so this is just a query that you can run. And uh, 
modify it and get information you want uh, about uh, your favorite author. Boom. Um, all right. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. Of demos. All right. Okay. Um, so, um, the road ahead. So, this is really just the beginning, right? So, we're far from being uh, anywhere close to where we want to be with this. Um, uh, with this project, um, and there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, there are a few, whoops. Help, okay. Okay, I think I'm lost here. Let's see. <coughs> yes. Okay. Um yeah, so there's a few lessons learned from, uh, from trying to put together such an initiative, right? Um, and first thing I want to say is that uh, it really helped to have a single measurable goal and try and drive a, a very large group of organizations towards getting, getting that done and focusing on that single metric that I really want to push to get to 100%. Um, second, the low cost, as I mentioned in the beginning, this would have not have been possible uh, without the data being already there in some capacity. We didn't ask people to start producing data, linked data, that's uh, very costly, and that's not something we can expect people to do um, overnight. Third, and I want to say most importantly, this is an initiative that was never pitched as an open access initiative. So we really truly believe that this is bipartisan. We believe that uh, regardless of your business model, um, you should support the notion of uh, opening up the uh, citation layer because this will benefit you as a publisher regardless of whether um, you believe in open access or traditional subscription-based publishing. Um, and uh, last but not least, focus on amplification. Make sure you build a, a large coalition of people who can help you amplify the message uh, and get the word out to people who are not there yet. So where, where we would like to see this going, um, what we really think is going to be the ultimate um, goal for, for this initiative is uh, the creation of a comprehensive graph for scholarship, right? Um, this is something that can only be built by a large number of organizations. There's no single player that can do this. Um, but in order to get there and to represent uh, how sources and um, institutions and authors uh, and pieces of knowledge all relate to each other, it is really critical to these data be made available at scale. So this is an example, again, coming from uh, the um, COS viewer and a quote from the author saying that uh, this is finally possible using data that used to be um, uh, privately licensed in the past. People ask often about the benefits. Uh, is this only something for publishers or researchers? Uh, I think the answer is that this benefits like a large set of stakeholders. It benefits uh, uh, authors who will be able to have uh, access to a record of their own um, citations for their works without having to retrieve this data from a specific database. Because the data will belong to them. Um, 
It benefits researchers who will be able to perform analysis of the citation graph um, in a way that is reproducible and open. Um, it will benefit uh, funders who will be able to reconstruct basically um, the, uh, uh, the impact of uh, uh, what, they're, what they're, they're spending, how they're investing their money, and basically vetting the, um, um, the impact metrics that are used for determining where this money goes. Uh, it will, we believe that it will also benefit publishers, like I said, uh, regardless uh, of their business model, because uh, making this data public available would just result in the creation of applications that will enhance the discoverability of uh, scholarly objects. Um, and finally, uh, the public. Uh, again, I think it's really important that uh, um, the public itself uh, um, have access to, uh, to this, this data. Uh, there are challenges, uh, and again, I want to uh, clarify the scope of what this is about. There was actually a lot of discussion online about uh, what 100% means. Uh, are we talking about the universe of citations or a tiny fraction of it? Um, Crossref is limited. Crossref data is limited both temporally and in terms of the scope of this data, right? So we're talking about uh, the bibliographic record of uh, papers that have a DOI assigned, and this is only a tiny fraction of the entire scholarship. And that also doesn't cover books and other types of publications and uh, decades and centuries of works uh, and their citations. So uh, this is just the beginning, and it's, it's not the end of the story. Um, and these are statistics about uh, the current coverage uh, of um, um, records in Crossref with reference data and the fraction of these uh, that are open. And obviously, aside from coverage, there's also a question about data quality. So we have uh, currently one billion references in Crossref in total. About half of these references, so half a billion, um, are open. Um, of these open citations, only 53% um, uh, have DOIs or some kind of identifier. So getting from raw, messy data to uh, a clean citation graph uh, that is duplicated, that uses identifiers, uh, that resolves authors, uh, uh, et cetera, is going to be a lot of work. And this is currently the main distinction between this project and the highly curated databases that I mentioned before that are really providing this value uh, in the form of curation. So the question is, how do we reach our goal of 100% coverage, again, with these limitations that I just mentioned? So as of today, we have uh, the vast majority of the top 20 publishers that we contacted. Um, this is the list uh, of uh, um, the publishers that produce the largest uh, volume of DOIs uh, that are currently are part of the initiative. It, as of today, we've definitely made significant progress, uh, but there are still some major exceptions. There are uh, the six publishers that um, are responsible for a very large amount of citations that haven't joined uh, the initiative yet. So if you happen to be an editor uh, or an author, or if you work with any of these publishers, uh, Please help us get the word out. It is really important that we get them on board uh, um, and persuade them to join the initiative. A month ago, Crossref announced this tool, uh, which you can look up yourself. It allows you to check for every individual publisher uh, statistics and the status of the references, the coverage of DOIs, the coverage of DOIs with open references, uh, and their default policy when it comes to reference distribution. And this just got in yesterday. Uh, we've received a lot of support for the initiative from multiple um, stakeholders. And uh, uh, the International Society for Infometrics uh, and Cytometrics uh, posted a letter basically calling all the major publishers who haven't joined yet the initiative to do so, uh, signed by basically the, the leading voices in the field. Um, so it's really humbling to have a um, all, all these voices in the, uh, in the field of centrometrics, basically people who care about uh, defining impact and impact metrics to be supportive of this notion of open citation data. So, like I said, there's still a very long way to go. We published um, an open call to action to our stakeholders um, a couple of months ago. 
And what that means is that if you're a journal editor, a researcher, a librarian, if you work for an organization that produces or consumes um, scholarly metadata and citation data, it is really critical that um, you, you help us and we hope you'll join the initiative to um, help further uh, the, the goal of open citation data. The citation graph belongs to the public and we need to be able to build upon it as a common good. With that, I'd like to thank you and I'd be happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you, Dario. Um, yes, we um, have lots of time for questions. So, anybody? Dario, this is a uh, fantastic initiative and it's exciting to see. Um, I've, I guess I've got one sort of crazy idea and uh, one question, crazy idea being uh, as we just, at our local institution, we just uh, suffered a case of uh, plagiarism of an article and uh, uh, actually from a thesis that, that was created to an article. But it's, it seems to me that comparing citation graphs may be a way of, like another sort of way of flagging possible, if things are too similar, another possible way of flagging that as, uh, as a defense. So having that openly available makes that yet another uh, possible um, outcome. Does it, it needs to be researched, but to see whether it's feasible, but that'd be good. Um, and I'm sure Sarvan would want to ask this at some point, but uh, um, the site's property in Wikidata is you know, a standard citation. Um, I don't see any sub-properties that allow some of the more fine-grained, uh, sort of the nature of the citation. I think, is, is there any hope of uh, sort of going back and adding extra data about the nature of the citation, whether it's positive or negative or something along those lines. Yeah, excellent questions. Um, yeah, on the, on the first comment, uh, yeah, so I think that uh, plagiarism is a, is a great example and great use case for this. Um, we've also talked a lot about uh, uh, tracking uh, retractions more effectively, right? So we still know that retracted papers keep accumulating citations. And partly, I believe, you know, having the citation graph as a public good should help us basically like raise this uh, uh, warning when, whenever someone is citing a paper has been retracted. Um, and in general, annotation, annotating citations with whatever metadata that we think are important. So plagiarism is a great example of something that I'm hopeful uh, this data will, will help uh, um, better, better understand. Um, on the second point, uh, yes, so uh, Wikidata now as a property to, represents, uh, um, to represent a citation between two items representing uh, creative works. Um, we haven't yet talked about how to further qualify the citation, although um, there are many people who are excited about, for example, uh, implementing a version of a cito, citation typing ontology or somehow adding additional qualifiers to these citations. Um, the one type of qualifier that's currently being used in Wikidata uh, is about the provenance. So pretty much the entire data model of Wikidata allows you to specify a reference for every single statement. And um, given that uh, Wikidata can currently ingest the citation data from a variety of sources, uh, cross-ref directly, the open citation corpus, PubMed, um, in some cases, it is really important that we keep track of where we get the citation information from. So um, we have the ability of specifying more information, uh, more qualifiers for citations. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet. Any other questions? Yeah. My name is Jarmo Sarekko. Uh, do you know any other uh, citation corpuses where, let's say, national peer-reviewed papers, non-English scientific papers could post their um, citation data? Because uh, I find that interesting problem that they, you have scientific publications not in English. And, and uh, they are sometimes they're also or often uh, referring to uh, publications in English and so on. So how to interlink all these 
uh, multi-language uh, publications yep. into each e other. Excellent question. So how to get you know, proper global coverage with, with this graph. Um, so a couple of things. First off, uh, um, cross-surf data really covers publishers uh, across many, many different countries. So as long as a publisher assigns the OIs, um, uh, it doesn't matter whether the publication is in English or any other language. So, um, but this is a requirement for this data to be uh, to be accessible. So, in other words, uh, unless there is a bibliographic record and unless uh, the publisher is opted into this program, uh, it's called cited by, uh, you will not get this data for free from the um, the cross APIs. Um, for journals and publishers that are not for whatever reason uh, interested in participating in, in CrossRef. Um, uh, there are projects like uh, the Open Citation Corpus that are trying to aggregate and transform and republish citations from a much broader set of sources. So I think the hope is that uh, down the line, no matter whether you're in CrossF or not, uh, that corpus will be able to grow and include also other references that are not otherwise available. I, I uh, think I didn't get the point if the uh, open citation corpus is being integrated into Wikidata or uh, is it to exist as a separate uh, corpus? Yeah, so the, corp the open citation corpus exists as its own standalone uh, corpus. It's actually a fairly complex uh, um, linked open data project that publishes and cleans up all this data, adding provenance and additional information about all the different entities. Um, Wikidata is really ingesting in, in an opportunistic way uh, some of this data. Uh, it's not ingesting and representing the entire RDF structure of the corpus. For people who are interested in proper RDF, again, personally, if you ask me, I tend to side with the pragmatic approach to you know, useful data without making it overly uh, complex when it comes to, uh, to its structure. Um, I think that Wikidata currently delivers good value for data consumers, but there are other use cases for which an RDF record is actually what you want, and uh, that's what the Open um, Citation Corpus provides. Anybody else? No? Okay, then we move on. Um, next, uh, thank you, Dario. <laughs>